This module introduces LIDARs, which are active remote sensing instruments that transmit visible or near-infrared radiation. As we mentioned in a previous module, for meteorological purposes, LIDARs are used most often for detection of very small targets, such as small ice crystals, cloud droplets, or aerosols that act as cloud condensation nuclei. A couple of LIDARs are pictured here just to give you a sense of their size. One is a downward pointing LIDAR inside a small aircraft, and the other is a vertically pointing LIDAR located inside a trailer pointing upward. Like radars, LIDARs transmit radiation and process the part of the transmitted signal that is backscattered to the sensor. The LIDAR equation is shown here, color coded by term, with the power received, the most fundamental variable detected by the receiver, on the left-hand side of the equation. The most useful variable that we generally want to derive from the observed power is the backscatter coefficient, denoted by the bolded beta in the equation. It is conceptually analogous to the radar reflectivity factor in the radar equation. Getting beta requires that we know values for the remainder of the terms in the LIDAR equation. The power received is, of course, directly proportional to the power transmitted. It also scales with the area of the telescope and inversely squared with the range. The yellow term is a LIDAR constant that is a function of properties of the LIDAR itself, such as pulse length, and sometimes the telescope area and the transmitted power are wrapped into this LIDAR constant. The final term depends on properties of the medium through which the LIDAR beam propagates and represents two-way attenuation of the LIDAR beam. And that's why the factor two is there, one trip out, one trip back. This term should look similar to some that we encountered when discussing Schwarzschild's equation earlier in the course. The sigma here is just the extinction coefficient and this integral along the path length is just the optical depth. The overlap function, shown in blue, represents the range-dependent fraction of the transmitted signal's cross-section that is contained within the receiver's field of view. We won't delve more into the LIDAR equation with much detail, but we will look shortly at some examples of LIDAR backscatter. Recall from earlier in the course this figure that depicted the scattering susceptibility and type of scattering predominant for several combinations of radiation wavelength on the x-axis and the scatterer size on the y-axis. Because LIDAR operates in visible light or near infrared around here on this diagram, it is susceptible to scattering by much smaller objects than the microwave radiation we've been talking about. LiDAR is susceptible to scattering by aerosols, cloud drops as well. We can see this by looking for at what size scatter is on the y-axis, the size parameter is greater for visible and near IR wavelengths than this chi equals one value right here. And that's about in here for 0.1 microns, which deals with large aerosols like smoke, dust, and haze on up to cloud drops. Any larger objects, such as liquid water cumulonimbus clouds, or even the ground, also, of course, cause a strong scattering interaction. An example of backscatter coefficient, plotted in microns per steradian on this plot, is shown here for a LIDAR operating at 532 nanometers in the green part of the visible spectrum. Detailed structure is seen in the lowest 2.5 kilometers, where the bank scatter is primarily caused by aerosols, which could be sea salt, dust, smoke particles, or other small particles. Above this layer, there is some cloud present throughout the time series. And what we're seeing is the base of the cloud, where it's very thick, and then several layers of cloud where it's more optically thin. Sometimes the low cloud, like this down here, these red areas, extinguishes the beam such that there is no return above it. But at most times the beam is able to partially penetrate to altitudes above two and a half kilometers in this example. As we were saying, for much of the time, the LiDAR sees cirrus cloud located between about 10 and 16 kilometers of altitude. 
However, between 4 and 10 UTC, the LiDAR beam encounters optically thick cloud. The beam becomes attenuated quickly, so only power from the bottom of the cloud is returned to the sensor. The backscatter coefficient is large there, and we can't see anything above. So only the power from the bottom of the cloud is returned to the sensor, and any cloud above this region of backscatter is just not detected. LiDAR can also be used to map topography and coastal bathymetry, like this example derived from aerial LiDAR near the Bixby Bridge along the Big Sur coastline using the same principles as discussed before. Topographic LiDAR generally uses near-infrared radiation at 1064 nanometers, while bathymetric LiDAR uses green light at 532 nanometers that can partially penetrate water. Doppler LiDAR is capable of measuring Doppler velocity to and away from the sensor along with backscatter. The following is an example of Doppler LiDAR data showing backscatter and vertical motion in clear air aerosol, some low cloud, and some upper level ice cloud. Like radar radial Doppler velocities, negative values indicate targets moving toward the LiDAR. For aerosols that are suspended in the atmosphere, the Doppler velocities are very close to the actual vertical component of air motions. While within clouds, in-cloud dynamics superimposed onto the false speed of hydrometeors determines the Doppler velocity, just as for cloud radar if pointing vertically. A water vapor differential absorption LiDAR, or DIAL, is a special type of LiDAR that is used to detect humidity at short range. The dial uses two narrow bands near each other. For example, one could be located along this blue dashed line, and the other could be located along this red dashed line. One of the bands is located within a water vapor absorption band near 727 or 815 nanometers, and the second band is located adjacent to the first, but just outside of the water vapor absorption band. The top panel shows an example of this concept with one band located in one of the four water vapor absorption bands depicted, and then the other band outside, as we just showed. The two adjacent wavelengths experience similar propagation through the atmosphere, except that one is impacted by water vapor and the other is not. Thus, the difference in the backscatter between the two can be attributed to the extinction coefficient in the LiDAR equation, which is related to the volume extinction coefficient, which is determined by the water vapor concentration. Like a radar, the dial is able to operate as a function of range, with radiation in the band not, impacting, not impacted by water vapor having a slightly larger return, with the discrepancy between the power returned in the two bands increasing with range unless the beam encounters completely dry air. The gate spacing depends largely on the magnitude of power transmitted. An I-safe dial may yield gate spacing on the order of 100 meters, but higher powered LIDARs can decrease this gate spacing and give higher resolution data. An example of water vapor dial data from a vertically pointing instrument is seen here in the top panel. The middle panel shows satellite-derived water vapor concentration of the same location at the same time. The bottom panel shows the same but derived from a ground-based vertically pointing microwave radiometer. While the three agree to first order, the dial captures much more structure in the humidity field, like this feature here, a little bit of heightened humidity between two and three kilometers here for example, that the other sensors cannot capture. This is especially true in terms of the range resolution of the dial versus the vertical resolution from the other two microwave radiometer products. A Raman LiDAR is a complicated sensitive instrument that transmits ultraviolet radiation and detects its backscatter. Like the dial, it transmits in narrow bands but near molecular nitrogen, oxygen, and water vapor absorption bands in order to collect remotely sensed measurements of temperature and humidity. Well-calibrated Raman LiDARs are extremely accurate sensors. On the left is an example of a time series of water vapor mixing ratio profiles measured by a Raman LiDAR, kind of similar to the profile time series we were looking at on the last couple slides. 
Again, detailed structure in the humidity field is visible. On the right is a comparison of the mixing ratio derived from weather balloon data, or the blue line, and the mixing ratio derived by the Raman LiDAR in red. The two match very closely, proving the utility of LiDAR for profiling the thermodynamic structure of the atmosphere to great accuracy and precision. Space-based LiDAR may be used to detect aerosols and extremely small hydrometeors that may be invisible to the naked eye, especially in sub-visible cirrus at high altitudes. Calypso is a companion satellite to CloudSat in the C-Train and operates at both 532 and 1064 nanometers. It uses a very narrow pencil beam pointing at Nader and captures profiles of aerosols and cloud backscatter with very high resolution. Like cloud radars, the LiDAR is strongly attenuated in deep convection and will not see low in the atmosphere in cases where there are deep clouds present. The image shown at left is an example of radar and LiDAR derived fields for a co-located vertically pointing radar and LiDAR observing a passing mesoscale convective system of time on the x-axis progressing over a 24 hour period from left to right. The top panel shows the Ka band reflectivity. It sees some high cirrus cloud as well as some low level precipitating cloud. However, the cloud radar is attenuated heavily when the heaviest rain passes over the instrument. And this is denoted by this white area of missing data that occurs during the rain event. The second panel denotes the LiDAR backscatter, which doesn't show nearly as much. It's almost completely attenuated where the rain occurs, but it detects some high cirrus cloud that the radar was not sensitive enough to detect, especially well before or a little bit after the system passed through. And some of this cloud is as high as 16 to 17 kilometers. Combined, the two instruments can be used to derive fields related to water content, such as down here, or to create products that indicate where clouds are present and the phase of those clouds. Another example of a cloud mask is shown at right. It is taken from a cross-section of CloudSat and Calypso data as they passed over a cloud system in rapid succession. And on the x-axis here is just lat long coordinates, which also is just progressing in time as the satellite passes over. Red and blue shading indicate parts of the cloud seen by radar, and blue and green colors indicate parts of the cloud seen by LiDAR. The Calypso LiDAR is very effective at detecting this high altitude cirrus that cloud radar cannot detect. Such subvisible cloud is a common occurrence, especially in the tropics, and it has important implications for radiative transfer in the context of Earth's climate system. Other than a few very shallow, non precipitating clouds at low altitudes with clear air above, the LiDAR in space does not detect backscatter from scatterers in the lower atmosphere in this example. Likewise, a LiDAR on the ground could not see through the precipitating cloud over here to detect the optically thin cirrus that's near the tropopause.